This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Celeste Evans filling in for Dee Dee Sharp. By now, who has not heard the story of Trayvon Martin, an unarmed teenager carrying candy and iced tea, who was shot dead by George Zimmerman, a 28-year-old neighborhood watchman. Now, initially, the story went unnoticed except for a few articles in local newspapers. The early accounts of the episode made it seem nothing more than a fight gone bad. The Martin family, grief-stricken and outraged by the tragic death of their son, along with their lawyers and friends, lobbied news outlets to examine what happened in Sanford, Florida. Eventually, the media did, and the story began to spread like wildfire, leaping from traditional news sources to the blogosphere and social media. Now that the story has gone global, the case has ignited a furor about issues concerning vigilante justice, racial profiling, and equitable treatment under the law. The case has stirred the pot of racial strife, and while the issues raised belong in the public discourse, they should not influence or cloud the facts or outcome of the case. Tonight, on this edition of AWARE, we'll look at the issues surrounding the Trayvon Martin case. We'll look at how laws such as Florida's Stand Your Ground law, the Castle Doctrine, and use of reasonable or excessive force and racial profiling impact our community. My guests tonight are attorney Mike Papantonio, a senior partner with the law firm Levin, Papantonio, Thomas Mitchell, Rafferty, and Proctor. Mr. Papantonio is also host of the syndicated radio show Ring of Fire. He is an author and frequently provides political commentary on MSNBC. We are also joined by Reverend Dr. H.K. Matthews, civil rights icon and author of the book Victory After the Fall. Elvin McCorvey, an elected official with the Emerald Coast Utility Authority and president of the Pensacola chapter of the NAACP. Jerry McIntosh, a community and civil rights activist and a member of Movement for Change. And Elson Bennett, a civil rights activist representing the SCLC Southern Christian Leadership Conference. All of you, welcome to AWARE. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank you. This story has gotten so much attention. Why? History. Okay. Um, history uh, has never been reconciled in this country since slavery. And because history hadn't been reconciled, uh, events like this, uh, some look at it as an event, but we look at it as history of a uh, long, uh, history of people being hung in this country, people being uh, shot, people being hunted down like animals uh, all over this uh, country, and police brutality, uh, Rodney King, now Trayvon, uh, when you listen at his cry, we all know it was a death cry uh, of when um, we heard it. So history, this is a part of a long history that has never been reconciled. And uh, the history of this country sometimes, and more than sometimes, has not been just, uh, especially in the, uh, the courts of this country. Okay, history, so absolutely it is nothing new, has been going on for decades, and of course not with just blacks. When we had 9-11, um, we had the situation with uh, Muslim Americans and Arab Americans, how can we stop this thing, racial profiling? Well, people have to start talking to uh, with one another, uh, have open dialogue, honest dialogue, and quit talking about one another and assuming. Um, this case with uh, Trayvon Martin was, was dear to me because uh, I have a 14-year-old grandson that lives in South Florida. Uh, it could have been him. Uh, I'm a former police officer, so I took personal interest in this case when the dispatcher, who is a certified uh, uh, law enforcement person by the state of Florida, uh, told Mr. Zimmerman 
do not approach. You know, back away, we got an officer en route. Uh, he should have followed that. Uh, I can tell you, a, as, a, as a certified police officer, uh, when I was uh, active and you're on the force, you get one opportunity to make a split decision about taking someone's life. And it's, it's tragic that uh, we have a law in the state of Florida, stand your ground, and people have used that uh, numerous times to take someone's life. Uh, it's different than someone breaking into your home or coming to your place of business and uh, they intend to do you bodily harm. But this young man uh, should not have been uh, followed, should not have been shot. Uh, and I'm hoping some legislation uh, come to pass about neighborhood watch people carrying a firearm because they put themselves in a situation that they should not be in. Okay. Um, Florida is being looked at for having relatively lax, lax <laughs> gun laws. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Papantonio, could you explain to us the difference between the, the Castle Doctrine and then the Stand Your, your Ground? Yeah, stand, stand Your Ground opened it up to, it was almost a Wild West mentality. Uh, stand Your Ground means that even on the street, the reason police officers and the reason that the prosecutors were so against this law, they testified time and time. They told Jeb Bush time and time again, do not do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeb Bush pushed it forward anyway because it was, uh, and, and they, they told the reasons why you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this because it, it's, it becomes a he said, he said issue. It is like we have here. This trial is going to unfold and, and the, the, the key witness is dead. And you have Zimmerman saying what he wants to say and you have a police department that's done a horrible job and add all that up and you have that situation that prosecutors and police officers told Jeb Bush, told the legislature you should not do this because all it's going to do is condone murder. That's what happened here. Okay. Um, and there were pro proponents of this bill, um, NRA and ALEC. Why do you think they wanted this particular bill passed? What's the reason? It's money. When a, when, a, when a law like this passes, and this isn't just me talking, this is, they've looked at the empirical data, when the, uh, when the gun lobby, let's not even say the NRA, okay. let's say when gun manufacturers are able to pass a law like this, sales start skyrocketing in that district. 21 states now have this law. If you look at every single state, the, 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 the sales have increased. It's not just, see, people like to say, well, people went out and bought guns because Obama was president and that they were being told that President Obama was going to take away our rights. They, were, they did it out of fear. They, it happens because the gun industry understands the more these laws they pass, mm -hmm. the bigger the sales are. Okay. Could you explain to us what ALEC is? Yeah, ALEC is an organization that most people have never heard of that, have, that has such a huge impact on our laws. They're an organization that's put together mostly by large corporations who fund the organization to virtually write laws. It, it's this outrageous, Celeste. The, the organization takes the time and writes a law, hands it to a legislator who is woefully incapable of understanding what's really going on. Mm -hmm. The legislator takes that law to the state capitol. We have cases actually where ALEC, this organization that's run by corporations that have a huge benefit in passing these various laws. It may be stand your ground. It may be laws that prevent people from voting. We have that go on. We have, they've passed laws that deregulate virtually everything. They're laws that are owned and operated by corporate America. So they write the law. The legislator, legislator takes it back to a place like Tallahassee. And we've seen cases where word for word, the law has been passed exactly how the corporation wrote it. Not how the legislator wrote it. And this is a good example. Stand your ground is, is on, the, on the ALEC agenda because the ALEC organization is getting money from corporations that want to increase sales. So right. there's, it's always about money, Celeste. Follow the story. This is one of those stories about money. And it un unfortunately has resulted in the death of this young man in dozens and dozens of people all over America, not just out of racial pro profiling, but because the, all of those issues have come together at the same point and bad decisions are made on the spot. And because of um, the 
outpouring of this case. Um, I think McDonald's was a supporter of Alec. Coca-Cola, they have now since withdrawn um, right. you, support. Yeah, there's Col Color of Change is a wonderful organization. If you're not aware of it, you mm -hmm. should be. It, it's, it's an organization that has set off. They're the same people who backed Rush Limbaugh down when he made those outrageous okay. statements. They're the same people who got the, the, this nutcase, Glenn Beck, off the air when he started making racial attacks day after day, clearly racial attacks. Color of Change got him off the air. They're the same people who've turned the ALEC issue around to where people are embarrassed. Corporations are finally, finally embarrassed to say they represent me, and why wouldn't they be? Mm -hmm. Because if, if you sell hamburgers, you can go to McDonald's to buy the hamburger, or you can go to Wendy's to buy the hamburger. And if you know that ALEC is being supported by, by McDonald's, you don't want to buy that McDonald's hamburger. Right, right, okay. All about the dollar. It's all about the money. Okay. Uh, Reverend Matthews, you have been involved with civil rights for many, many years. Here we are, 2012. We have uh, an African-American president. Do things appear to be going in reverse as far as civil rights are concerned? Uh, actually, I think so. Okay. Because I think the level of hatred uh, has risen uh, to such a height since uh, President Obama uh, has been in office until it's frightening. And um, one might mention the, uh, you asked the question about the defend your castle and stand your ground law. Well, Jeb Bush, in signing that law, um, signing that into law in, in 2005, caved in to the far right. That's what he did. But oftentimes when these people sign these uh, things into law, they don't really understand what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because now, when you talk about standing your ground law, it could be said, or could be argued, that Trayvon Martin was standing his ground. The fact of the matter was that, uh, I think as Ellison pointed out, uh, he was directed, instructed, not to pursue uh, this kid with these Skittles and iced tea. Uh, and, and of course his remark was they always get away. What they, he had reference to, no, <laughs> you know, we don't have to guess. But um, if in fact Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, Zimmerman uh, were in close combat, who's to say who attacked who? Mm -hmm. Who's to say that, that uh, Trayvon is a kid who's walking home? in the dock, by himself, and, and somebody comes up behind him, and him not knowing, he, he didn't identify himself as a law enforcement person, he didn't say who he was. Um, he had, first of all, had no business being armed out there as a uh, neighborhood watch mm -hmm. captain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if they were in close combat, who is to say that Trayvon Martin was not protecting himself? self-defense on the part of Trayvon Martin, not on the part, because first of all, who initiated the uh, confrontation? And in, in my estimation, and from what I've been hearing on the news and reading uh, in the printed media, is that Zimmerman initiated uh, the contact. Uh, you know, we're not, not here to determine his guilt or innocence, mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is, when you look at it and see that He's a kid minding his own business, and Zimmerman should have been minding his. Uh, and the kid winds up dead. And, you know, it's kind of hard to believe anything Zimmerman says, at, especially after we found out about that $200,000 that he has back there. Now, so we begin to wonder, can you believe anything he says? Mm -hmm. um, so Trayvon was unarmed, walking home with Skittles and an iced tea, and wearing a hoodie. Mm -hmm. um, journalist Geraldo Rivera um, basically gave a warning to parents to warn their children not to wear hoodies because it could get them killed. It, is that a, a good warning, bad warning? Is it telling young people, well, you can't wear what you want to wear? What are we no, saying here? I don't think it's a matter of telling them what they can't wear, mm -hmm. but I think, it's, I think it's a good warning, mm -hmm. actually, uh, because I think it's a warning to parents uh, telling their children uh, 
to beware mm -hmm. of what you wear because it could get you killed. Uh, his crime was, I guess, uh, WB, WWB, mm -hmm. walking, walking while, while black, black. <laughs> uh, uh, wearing, a, wearing a hoodie. You know, it's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that, that even did. even if he did not have on the hoodie, he might have been shot and killed. Right. Anyway. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. The fact yes. of the matter was that he was in an area that he was legally uh, in, and nobody had a right to stop him from going home. But Mr. Zimmerman <clears throat> took it upon himself. Uh, to make sure he didn't get home, I guess, from what I can determine from what happened on that night out there. And, of course, if he had bruises in the back of his head, uh, grass stains on him, certainly that might have come from a tussling match. Mm -hmm. But who initiated it? Why, why would he be close enough to Trayvon after being advised not to follow him uh, for all of this to happen uh, to him. So are we talking about just blatant stereotyping with, with the racial profiling? Right. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we tend to overlook in this case is that there is a deep fear in the African-American community of police officers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually when police officers are in the area they, people tend to act a different way. They, they tend to uh, go into a shell. They tend to want to get out of the area and not be confronted by police officers because some of the things that have happened to people over the years by police officers, you know, people have been killed and, you know, no explanation, no laws to bring about conviction or even an investigation because there have been many cases here in, in Pensacola. Just like we talked about the young man that was killed by the police officer on Savante Street and uh, was run over. And there has, that case has not been resolved because even though the officer was never charged, there is no justification for what he did. He made bad decisions. But yet and still, the local law, uh, the courts, the prosecution did not investigate that case and bring that young man to trial. Okay. And that was part of the, the outrage with this Trayvon case, that it took so long. There was no arrest. Um, evidence was not properly gathered. Um, missed opportunity? Well, I, think, and, I think so. Uh, you know what? I, as I listened to, to, uh, to, to you speak about this, I, it, as I was listening to you, uh, Reverend, I, you remember Emmett Teal? Yes. Mm -hmm. The Emmett Teal story was one of those events that moved, that first of all, it, it attracted attention. Mm -hmm. It said something is fundamentally wrong. But the Emmett Teal story, before the Emmett Teal story, happened again and again and again before Emmett Teal mm -hmm. was ever even noticed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, Emmett Teal is murdered. And what, and, and, and Morris Dees, we were talking about before the show, Morris Dees has been a friend of mine a long, long time, a Southern Poverty Law Center. And we talked about this one time. He said, you know, nothing, nothing changes in this country in giant leaps. It's always, it happens when, when Dr. King finished what his mission was, as, as far as he could finish it. The, the next, there was, there was almost, there was change that took place. But if you look back, that change didn't take us, didn't take this country where Dr. King thought it was going to take us. It's, it's, it's these events it's the Emmett Teal, it's the Trayvon Martin, that all of these events coalesce sometimes. And all of a sudden, people say, in the civil rights movement, you know it much better than I do. You were in the middle of it. You saw it. You lived through it uh, much more than I do. But all I can do is share what I've read. But you had people dog-sicked on them, uh, fire hydrant hoses unleashed, murdered, uh, all types of awful things taking place. But it wasn't any one event that moved culture ahead. As Morris D. said, it's the culmination of those events. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a Trayvon Martin here. Mm -hmm. It is the next young man that's going, that this is going, this is going to happen again. It's not a matter of will it happen, it's just where. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, do we start saying, okay, it's time. 
It's time to say this, this, this ridiculous right-wing movement that's taking place in this country that's dividing us. It's dividing us on the way we look and the way we speak, and that's where you have racial, racial profile. At some point, does all that culminate and we have a giant leap in our culture? A giant leap, the kind of leap that Dr. King dreamed of, the kind of leap that you dreamed of when it was all taking place, that you said, the kind of leap that we all dreamed of when President Obama took over. We said, this is, a, this is one of those, th those leaps. It wasn't a leap, but it was an event. Mm -hmm. Trayvon Martin is one of those events. Mm -hmm. Uh, last week, there was a Senate hearing committee on racial profiling, and we do have some videotape courtesy of C-SPAN, and uh, I'd like to take a look at that video now. Racial profiling is not new. At the dawn of our republic, roving bands of white men known as slave patrols subjected African-American freedmen and slaves to searches, detentions, and brutal violence. During the Great Depression, Many American citizens of Hispanic descent were forcibly deported to Mexico under the so-called Mexican repatriation. And during World War II, tens of thousands of innocent Japanese Americans were rounded up and held confined in internment camps. Twelve years ago, twelve years ago, in March 2000, this subcommittee held the Senate's first ever hearing on racial profiling. It was convened by then-Senator John Ashcroft, who would later be appointed Attorney General by President George W. Bush. In February 2001, in his first joint address to Congress, President George W. Bush said that racial pro profiling is, quote, wrong and we will end it in America, end of quote. We take the title of today's hearing from the promise President Bush made that night 11 years ago. In June 2001, our former colleague, Senator Russ Feingold of Wisconsin, my predecessor as chairman of the subcommittee, held the Senate's second and most recent hearing on racial profiling. I was there. There was bipartisan agreement about the need to end racial profiling. Then came 9-11. In the national trauma that followed, civil liberties came face to face with national security. Arab Americans, American Muslims, South Asian Americans faced national origin and religious profiling. To take one example, the special registration program targeted Arab and Muslim visitors, requiring them to promptly register with the INS or face deportation. At the time I called for the program to be terminated, there were serious doubts if it would help us in any way to combat terrorism. Terrorism ex experts have since concluded that special registration wasted Homeland Security resources and, in fact, alienated patriotic Arab Americans and American Muslims. More than 80,000 people registered under that program. More than 13,000 were placed in deportation proceedings. Even today, many innocent Arabs and Muslims face deportation because of special registration. So how many terrorists were identified by the special registration program? None. Next Wednesday, the Supreme Court will hear a challenge to Arizona's controversial immigration law. The law is one example of a spate of federal, state, and local measures in recent years that under the guise of combating illegal immigration have subjected Hispanic Americans to an increase in racial profiling. Arizona's law requires police officers to check the immigration status of any individual if they have, quote, reasonable suspicion, close quote, that the person is an undocumented immigrant. Well, what is the basis for reasonable suspicion? Arizona's guidance on the law tells police officers to consider factors such as how someone is dressed and their ability to communicate in English. Two former Arizona attorneys general, joined by 42 other state attorneys general, filed an amicus brief in the Arizona case in which they said, quote, application of the law requires racial profiling, close quote. And of course, African Americans continue to face racial profiling on the streets and sidewalks of America. The tragic, tragic killing of Trayvon Martin is now in the hands of the criminal justice system. But I note that according to an affidavit filed by investigators last week, the accused defendant, quote, profiled Trayvon Martin and, quote, assumed Martin was a criminal, close quote. The senseless death of this innocent young man has been a wake-up call to America. And so, 11 years after the last Senate hearing on racial profiling, we return to the basic question. What can we do to end racial profiling in America? 
We can start by reforming the Justice Department's racial profiling guidance, issued in 2003 by Attorney General John Ashcroft. The guidance prohibits the use of profiling by federal law enforcement in, quote, traditional law enforcement activities, end of quote, and that's a step forward. However, this ban does not apply to profiling based on religion and national origin, and it does not apply to national security and border security investigations. In essence, these exceptions are a license to profile American Muslims and Hispanic Americans. As the nonpartisan Congressional Research Service concluded, the guidance, quote, numerous exceptions may invite broad circumvention for individuals of Middle Eastern origin and profiling of Latinos. Today, Congressman John Conyers and I are sending a letter signed by 13 senators and 53 members of the House asking Attorney General Holder to close the loopholes in the Justice Department's racial profiling guidance. Congress should also pass the End Racial Profiling Act, and I welcome the attendance of my colleague and a former member of this committee, Senator Cardin of Maryland, who has taken up this cause uh, from our colleague, Senator Feingold, and he's here today to testify. Let's be clear, and I want to say this and stress it. The overwhelming majority of law enforcement officers perform their jobs admirably, honestly, and courageously. They put their lives on the line to protect us every single day. But the inappropriate actions of a few who engage in racial profiling create mistrust and susp suspicion that hurt all police officers. We'll hear testimony to what has been done in a positive way to deal with this issue by superintendent of police. That's why so many law enforcement leaders strongly oppose racial profiling. Racial profiling undermines the rule of law and strikes at the core of our nation's commitment to equal prote protection for all. You'll hear from the experts on our panel today. The evidence clearly demonstrates that racial profiling simply does not work. I hope today's hearing can be a step towards ending racial profiling in America at long last. Well, a step towards ending racial profiling. What do you think? Will we be having yet another hearing five years from now, ten years from now? I think you will. Until people change their hearts and minds about human beings. Um, I, as I said, as a former police officer, I, I know someone asked me a question. In the police academy, do they teach you the racial profile? No, they don't. You as an individual make that decision when you put on that badge and that uniform. Be because you are certified by the state of Florida, that doesn't give you a right to violate somebody's basic rights. Um, I'm glad uh, that uh, we're having this discussion, and I'm glad Mr. Durbin uh, stated that Trayvon was racially profiled, and he was murdered. Uh, I'm hoping to see legislation, as I said earlier, would ban neighborhood watch people from carrying a firearm. Okay. Now, to go a bit further, getting back to what Mr. McCarvey said, that, that used to be a time, and I can remember a time, when uh, we in the African-American community could look at policemen as being protectors or as being friends. It's reached a point now that we become apprehensive when we see a policeman. And the sad thing about it, had it not been, and I know we'll, uh, it, it, we were criticized about this for the demonstrations and all of the outpouring of uh, people marching and carrying on for Trayvon Martin, but had that not happened, right. we probably would not be as far along in this case as we are. And the sad thing about it, and I know this firsthand, uh, I've experienced it even recently, where the chief of police in a city and the district attorney are in bed together, hand in hand. That's why Trayvon, uh, Zimmerman was not arrested that night. Mm -hmm. Had Zimmerman been black, he would have been thrown in jail if he had made it to the jail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just being factual. Right. Uh, and, and, and the other sad part about it in, in, in the racial profiling, when the district attorney and the police chief or 
working hand in glove together, whatever the police chief says, the district attorney, uh, the state attorney, whatever it might be, goes along with it. But the real, real sad part is that you've got black policemen on these forces, and again, I'm speaking from experience, who go along to get along. Mm -hmm. They will do anything not recognizing or realizing the fact that if they find themselves in the shoes of that black person that they're going along, they will be given the same treatment. Mm -hmm. And it's sad that, that they will allow themselves to be used as pawns. Now, I don't, I don't know, but, but, but that policeman, that police chief, he, he wanted to resign. Why, what was the problem? They didn't allow him to resign. You mean the police chief in stuff. Sanford, right? right. In mm -hmm. Sanford, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why, why couldn't he resign? <laughs> Mr. Bonaparte is sitting back there as a Bonaparte. And, uh, now, to be fair to him, he did accept the resignation. It was the city council that rejected it. But, yeah, uh, the city commission yeah, rejected it. Uh, he was going yeah, to accept, accept it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, but uh, still, I still wonder <laughs> why did the city council reject, reject it? Right. If they didn't feel that that uh, he was right in what he did. Right. You know, um, go, when you go back to the the early '80s, uh, when Reagan come, came to uh, power in this country as the president, they, their whole focus became on the so-called war on drugs. And the war on drugs became a war on black people. Racial profiling became uh, the thing to do at that time because of the kind of finances that was coming to, to different communities for the war on drugs. And so as, as, a, as, a, as the war on drug picked up speed, more and more black people was profiled. More and more black people was put in prison uh, for minor stuff. And then uh, under the, the Clinton administration, who um, made all these draconian laws, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> uh, um, uh, that uh, three strikes you out and all of these laws that came about under his administration because he was trying to outright the right or outflank them, whichever way you want to put it. And, and he, he allowed these laws to come into, uh, into a being. And now these laws are affecting us in ways that we never even dreamed of. Uh, because at one time, you know, I had read a story back in, in the late 70s that prison would almost be obsolete in this country. And now prisons are being populated uh, by watching young men um, at, uh, in the fourth grade, what kind of grades they are making, they build in prison in comparison to that. It's an industry. It's, yeah. an, yeah. it's, it's, it's an industry. Profit. It's, yes. the next, it's the next so, new profit center. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Profitability <laughs> in, in crime. Well, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. If there aren't enough people in the prison beds, well, we're going to put some more in there. Right. That's, part of the whole, that's part of the whole privatization issue. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned though Clinton, and uh, you couldn't be more uh, more correct. Mm -hmm. We we all we all come to these we we have these notions that uh, we we hear. I call it I call it political mythology, right. and that is that well Bill Clinton was a Democrat and therefore he was all on our side. Right. Well, he might have been somewhat on our <laughs> side, but while ben, Bill Clinton was in in, in place, the Ra racial profiling had its biggest boost. Yeah. The other way it had its biggest boost was mm -hmm. while we were worried about who's going to win in the Senate and who's mm -hmm. going to win in the House mm -hmm. up in Washington, D.C., what was happening is mm -hmm. the Republicans were packing the courts right. with, with Republican right-wing ideologues mm -hmm. that are supposed to be judges. Now, we just heard, we just heard Durbin talking about the Supreme Court's looking at this case right mm -hmm. now. I heard the argument. Okay. And if you think for a second that this is a Supreme Court that thinks it's wrong to racially profile, then we're kidding ourselves. Mm -hmm. exactly. This is a 5-4 Supreme Court. We allowed it to happen. We allowed it to happen, not just at the Supreme Court level. We allowed it to happen at the trial, the federal trial level and the federal appellate level. We were worried about who was going to win the Senate. Now, where are the big racial issues and the, the, the issues that we're talking about? Where are they decided? 
Legislation can take right. place all day long. They can write laws that make fairness. They make fairness in the way we treat people. They can write all the laws they want. The courts are the people who have the last say. So 25 years ago, 25 years ago, their plan was to pack the courts. Right now, 70 percent, startling number, 70 percent of the federal judiciary are packed with what I call Republican ideologues. Now, do you think this Supreme Court with Alito and Clarence Thomas, who hasn't asked <laughs> right. a question in six years, right. has not asked a question in six years, or Roberts, uh, are they, they're going to they're do something to give uh, America relief <laughs> on this racial divide that's taking place in Arizona? No. Uh, I didn't hear any question that led me to believe no. that coming from the Supreme in, Court. Uh, no. in, in, in defense of Clarence Thomas... He doesn't know how to ask a question. <laughs> so, you know, I mean... He may, not, he may not want us to know what he's thinking. <laughs> but, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't think. Yeah. Uh, no, but when you, you, you talk about racial profiling, right here in Pensacola, about a month and a half ago, a young girl walking to school said that a man mm. attempted so to kidnap her black male. That's what she said. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, they found out mm -hmm. nobody tried to kidnap her. Mm -hmm. It was a hoax. But to show you how the teaching is coming down the pipe, right. you know, something happened to you, cry black male. Several years ago, y'all remember this lady right. who killed her children. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first thing she said was a black male. Mm -hmm. So so we are an endangered species. You know, anything that comes up, we not only are we endangered, but we are convenient. You know, the black male, the black male. And uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely preposterous uh, the way we have been profiled. Well, you but know, you know, go ahead. it's a shame that we live in a country where we have to be in fear all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in the evening hours when we are going someplace and if you drive a decent car and you dress nicely and you get stopped. Mm -hmm. The kind of approach that officers will use to uh, approach you mm -hmm. will create a confrontation because there is little disrespect for the black male. The fact that you are driving a decent car and look good, you become a boy. And they use those type of terminology to mash your button, mash your hot button, to get you to respond in such a way so they can arrest you. And, uh, and they will write up a whole litany of things to get you charged. And those are the kinds of things that we are fighting on a daily basis. And that's what we have to teach our young people. When a law enforcement officer approach you, we need to tell them how to respond. There are some things they should not do. Because when you do that, you're only giving gasoline for them to continue to escalate the situation. And we don't need that in our... We have a, a document... Uh, that the NAACP put out. It is called the five, no, the four, the five, no, the 411 on the 50. And it gives you a, a list of steps there to do when being approached by an officer of the law and to tell you what not to do. Because I mean, think of how horrible that is. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, can, yeah. I, I, I can't yeah. imagine now. Right. Here, Mike, you need this list. <laughs> right. If you're driving through a neighborhood, yes. and somebody yes. here's what you need. Yes. Well, I, I'm interested, and in, I, 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 I'm dying to ask this question. <laughs> is it generational, do you think? Do, no. Is it generational, or is it to the point to where it's been so completely handed down from generation to generation? You see, the, you, you have the conservatives in this country. I don't know if you caught Karl Rove's statement oh, now, yeah. uh, two weeks ago. Mm, yeah. You know what he said? Mm -hmm. If we can keep 4% of right. the African Americans from voting, if yeah. we'd have kept 4% of yeah. the African Americans <laughs> from voting, mm. Obama never would have won. Right. Okay, so now what's happening? Now what are we seeing? We're seeing these don't vote laws. Right. We're seeing these, these massive attempt mm -hmm. to prevent people from voting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I read between the lines, I hope 
that maybe these conservatives understand, A, it might be generational, and, and B, there is a demographics shift that's taking place in America. Mm -hmm. And the demographics are such that this idea of keeping people under your thumb may be a thing of the history, mm -hmm. of history, and that's what the conservatives are so concerned about. Right. Did you see that statement yeah, by Carl Rosen? Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw it. In, I, I, I mentioned out there before mm -hmm. we came in mm -hmm. about this voter ID business, um, picture ID, mm -hmm. where the Amish people, the Amish people, don't take pictures. Right. And they are Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so when they when they <laughs> That's poetic. And, and, well when they got into when they got into that business yeah. of photo ID, mm -hmm. they forgot about the Amish people. Which is In a part of that they which need is, Pennsylvania. That's right, which is a part of that base. Uh -huh. So if they can't vote without voter ID, picture ID, what's gonna happen uh -huh. in that area? They're gonna have to go around now and try to Scramble and do something else. Okay. They will. I mean, they outsmart themselves. They, I mean, they outdumb themselves. Let's hope. Right. Well, let let, let me get back uh, to I'm this. Sorry, that, that's okay. Um, Mr. Zimmerman has been charged with second degree murder. And there are some people saying, well, well, why not first degree murder? Could you explain to us a little bit about the differences between first degree, second degree, and then manslaughter? Yeah. First degree is merely premeditated. It says that somebody's formulated an idea before they do it to murder somebody. Now, that can happen in a minute. You were talking earlier about the idea that the call comes in, um, the, uh, he's, talking to, 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 he's, he's talking to the dispatcher, the dispatcher says, listen, do not pursue. We've got it under control. There's no need for you to do that. Add that to the idea that he pursues, number one. Add that to the idea that the child has taken himself out of the zone of conflict and then Zimmerman has, has then moved into the zone of conflict, all right? Add to that the statements. We still don't know really what those statements are all about, but what I'm hearing, they're pretty bad. It's, it's, it's like the statement, well, they always get away with everything. So if you take all of that, you take the totality of that, and you say, can we take this information and formulate an argument that says that this person, Zimmerman, had a premeditated notion that he was going to murder that child either way. Now, uh, uh, to, to have been a prosecutor, you always want to charge more than you think you can get. Mm -hmm. So now he's looking at second degree. Second degree is simply saying, now, he can, now, by the way, second degree murder with a firearm, he can end up with a life, with a life sentence. Okay. But you've got to show malice of thought and there's some other things. But manslaughter, manslaughter ought to be the one that sticks if it's going to stick at all. Okay. And, and that's still bad. It was manslaughter, he could be looking at 30 years. A, it was a minor that was, was involved in manslaughter. And B, it was, a, it was a, a, a gun that was involved. That enhances the sentencing for something like that. Okay. And it becomes such a shocker when a white person is convicted of killing a black person. Mm -hmm. You remember the case over in Jay, mm -hmm. where this white young man killed this black young man who was... Right fleeing. It was a shocker mm -hmm. to that community right. when he was found guilty mm -hmm. because they were so sure mm -hmm. that he was going to get away. I mean, nothing was going to happen, but he even made the statement, the young man who did the killing said, this is a white predominant, he didn't even have it right, mm -hmm. yes. this is a white predominant <laughs> uh, community. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all of the people in that area were just so sure that that he was going to get away and nothing was going to be done. And I was praying. He had two options, 25 years of life in prison. And I said, sometimes life in prison, you can get out early. Mm -hmm. 25 years, you won't. <laughs> yeah. Because, I, I mean, it was a matter of pure race mm -hmm. that he took that kid's life. And, and, you know, I uh, reflect on what happened in Mobile, Alabama, when uh, a young man was walking home and was abducted by two Klansmen. Uh, he was beaten, his throat was cut, and this was the early 80s. 81. Uh, uh, 80 to 19, Donald, in yeah. 1981. Michael and uh, uh, those members of the Klan were sued by the Southern Poverty Law yeah. Center. Uh, the mother received 10, uh, I'm sorry, $7 million in assets and 
and what uh, other properties and whatever that they had. Mm. Yes, yeah. and it, cl it closed it down. Yeah. So that that is the hope that uh, I go on with day to day that we still have people of goodwill out there that would look at these acts of hate and murder and and the injustices uh, that some judges will impose on uh, certain groups of people. Uh, we we as a people must not ever give up hope that there is a God that stands above us all and require us to do what is just and what is right. And I hasten to add, too, that racial profiling, regardless of what side it comes from, is wrong. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care. You know, th this beating that took place over in Mobile, mm -hmm. where that man is that lying on his is in critical condition. Almost deathbed. Mm -hmm. That was uncalled for. Right. I mean, I I don't I don't condone racism on either side. And we've got it on both sides. And we have yeah. to acknowledge that. We've we've got people who look at somebody because they're white and they hate them immediately. W without knowing why. Uh, just because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. I don't care who does it. Right. But on the other hand, there is a lot of apathy on behalf of the American people mm -hmm. in trying to correct some of these problems. People, as long as it's not affecting me, mm -hmm. yes. I'm not concerned about it. Right. So how do we change that? Well, that's the big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 what I'm afraid, we are, we don't want to admit this. Nobody sitting around here wants to admit this. We are fearful people. Yes. Fear drives, fear drives us to do horrible things. It drives us to do, it, it, it drives us to treat people wrong. Mm -hmm. it, we don't want to, we don't want to admit it. You see, we, we have this image that we're Americans and, mm -hmm. you know, nothing scares us. We're the pioneers and, rugged you know, we're pitch. rugged, the rugged <laughs> American. <laughs> but when you, yeah. we are, but when you look behind the mm -hmm. studies mm -hmm. about, about, Especially, I, I don't mean to sound. <laughs> no. I don't mean to sound too hard on the conservatives. But you look at that conservative side. A lot of th things they do, they do out of fear. Mm -hmm. They don't want change. They don't want. They can't. Uh, they can't adapt to somebody that looks different and talks different. They can't adapt to an idea. They can't change because change is difficult. Change is, makes us even more fearful. But in America, one of the underlying themes that you that I see constantly about this this type of change you're mm -hmm. talking about is the biggest impediment is we are fearful people. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you change that. I, I don't. Right. We don't like to think of our. I'm not saying we're all scaredy cats, mm -hmm. but I'm saying fear. Fear drives, fear is why we have gun sales, highest in the world. Mm -hmm. You don't have gun sales like this in Canada right, or right. any place. Mm -hmm. well, everybody's got 10 guns. Well, mm -hmm. One right. ought to be enough. <laughs> you know, don't you think? They're ready for the next war. <laughs> some, some conservatives can't adapt to the fact that, that they are conservatives or that they are poor. Oh, yeah. And that poor people oftentimes are profiled also. Oh, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. course. You know, there, there was a comment uh, made uh, by President Obama. He said, if I had a son, he would look just like Trayvon. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people, some people was outraged oh. by that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he was speaking as a father. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I say to those uh, right-wingers or the extreme conservative people, we had 43 presidents who didn't look like me. We have one that does. And he cannot change everything that's wrong with America in four years. Let me say this. Um, the, the, when you sit in the well of the Congress, the most powerful place in the world, uh, while the president is speaking and you call him a liar, a liar. before the world, you are, you, are saying, you are saying to the world, that um, you don't care anything about really your country. Mm -hmm. That was really unpatriotic. And then you have another congressman calling the president uh, tar baby. And then you have others saying all, using all kinds of language. And that language is passed down to people who, who are really not political savvy, 
who don't understand what's what's taking place, and they thinking this is something against them. How about and when so, you have a federal judge, a federal, federal judge, judge right. saying mm -hmm. that uh, President mm -hmm. Obama is mm -hmm. the product of a dog? Right. A federal, a judge. federal judge. And you know what? Mm -hmm. That federal judge is still sitting on the bench. Right. Yes. He is still mm -hmm. sitting on the bench. So what? Now are we not? Flows from there, does are it? we not mm -hmm. outraged enough? Yeah. We should be outraged mm -hmm. enough that we will vote in this coming election with mounting numbers more so than we right. did right. four years right. ago. Right. See, right. that's what we have to do. We have to take this outrage and use it in the voting polls. And that's what Dr. King was trying to exactly. tell us. Give us the ballot. And we can bring about change mm -hmm. and justice and equality. One of the problems we have in this country is the lack of knowledge. Right. People don't know our history, as you mm -hmm. pointed out. Teach it anymore. Just like uh, the, as they have dubbed it, Obamacare. Mm -hmm. If they take would take that mm -hmm. health care law and go back to the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. same, mm -hmm. thing. same Nixon. document. Nixon administration. But but then the people are fighting <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. it because they're mm -hmm. saying it's Obamacare. And I'm upset too, anyway, with the president because. I was at the post office the other day and I stood in line 15 minutes. <laughs> Nobody waiting on me. <laughs> you know, that cut back, yes. That point about that you just made is such yes. an important point. Something's happened. As a matter of fact, I, I interviewed somebody today on the, uh, for the Ed Schultz show. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how the blue dog Democrats are losing elections. Now, mm -hmm. think of how valuable that is. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, President Obama has been up there with a Democrat. We all said, well, he had a Democratic Congress. No, no he, he didn't, didn't have no, a Democratic no, he Congress. No, no, he, he, had de he had blue dog Democrats that were sometimes worse than Republicans. Now, this election, yes. it can be all over. Look, who do you have? You have, you have a guy that looks like he's off of Gilligan's Island. He's the millionaire, uh, Thurston Howell. The third, mm -hmm. uh, running against Obama. Yes. You've got a man who can't relate to the American public at all. You've got a man that is that is the, the worst projection. He's everything we would expect for a, the kind of projection that Obama can beat. Now, this is it. The, the last, yes. Obama's last election was not it. This, this is it. Because you win now... And you put you put Karl Rove back on his heels. He wants to steal the election. You put all the blue dog Democrats who've stopped President Obama from moving on changes on the very mm -hmm. issues we're talking right. about here. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you have a Democratic Congress, and then then it's show or tell time for President Obama. Yes, sir. then we say then we say President, Mr. President. Now, there's no more excuses here. You've got it. This is That's it. Right. More than ever, this is it. And it will also present an opportunity to balance the Supreme Court out. Right. If he, yeah, if he, gets, if, if he doesn't, if he doesn't, you know what the Supreme Court goes? Supreme Court goes six to three. Yes. Right. Six to three. And, and let me just ask you something. I mean, six four at least. Mm -hmm. Very, so, uh, six three. Six so, three. So you got six three. And what happens here? What happens in all that? Well, it's your, your grandchildren, your children mm -hmm. for gener two generations are right. going to live with something that looked like America circa 1930, right. when yes. FDR said, I've got to save democracy by doing something that matters. That's where we could end up in this election. This yeah. election, we all said the, the first time around, the Obama election, was this is it. Right. This is right. it. Yeah. Well, what do you think will happen with uh, the Supreme, Supreme Court and this immigration law? It's sort of pitting um, the state of Arizona with the Obama administration. Well, if I listen to the, first of all, the, I didn't think the, the, uh, the argument was done on behalf of the, uh, of the U.S. very well. That's the first thing. The second thing is the questions. I mean, come on. You listen to the questions. It was like they were embracing the idea. Now, sometimes a U.S. Supreme Court argument will go like that. You'll hear the argument and you'll say, they're going to rule like mm -hmm. this. But this is a fun, if you look at the cases that are front end loaded, now, I'm telling you, in the mm -hmm. next, in just in the next several settings of the U.S. Supreme Court, if you look at what's front and loaded, racial issue after racial issue, mm -hmm. immigration issue, uh, just a uh, women's rights issue, right. uh, just, just look at what's front and loaded right now. This is one of those things where we're, we're going to see... We've all talked about it, and that is they're going to control the United States through the Supreme Court. This is going to be a sign right here. If you can, if you can stop a man because he looks Hispanic, and, and, and you can put him, and that's a probable cause, he's walking around and he's Hispanic, and you can put him in the back of a, of a, of a car because of that mm -hmm. and take him down to jail, mm -hmm. 
what have we become? We've right. become we become Berlin, 1929. And so then the issue with the, the Supreme Court case, it's whether uh, a state has the right to enforce its own immigration exactly. laws, or yeah. is it the sole role of the federal that's, government? That's the, that's, yes, that's that should the be argument. the argument. Yeah. The Federalism federal versus state rights. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the argument. Yeah. And I say people must take a stand mm -hmm. that no matter what the Supreme Court decides, people will not stand for people to be violated on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and this is why we need organizations and, and, and people like Mr. Papantonio, who, who's outspoken and up there uh, receiving threats against his life because he, he see a need for justice and equality for everyone. Okay. And I think the key role that he plays is by putting out good information, mm -hmm. yeah. information that people need. Because most people are not going to do the research on their own. Right. They, right. They're not. So they're going to have to identify with someone that they trust. Mm -hmm. Watch Ed Schultz. Okay. Can I say yeah. that? <laughs> you, want, I watch, you want to hear somebody. It, it, how watching. many years have we watched progressives? We're, yes. we're liberals. Mm -hmm. How many years have we watched them show up Right. At a at a not at a gunfight with a knife. Yeah. Right. And now yeah. all of a sudden you have this whole Order new you have big. this whole new <laughs> mo movement. You have the empower, empowerment of the African American. Mm -hmm. Have y'all ever sat down with Reverend Sharpton? I oh, have. I've spent a lot of time with mm -hmm. Reverend. Now that's the kind of voice it takes. You said it earlier. Now you think anything would have happened on Trayvon Martin had no. Sharpton and you and everybody around here mm -hmm. not said we can't t we can't stand this anymore. <laughs> so in other words, we need. More voices, uh, louder so, voices. Let me tell you. People need to stand up. Strength. Strength. Now right. I know right. this may be pushing it too far. Y'all may not totally disagree mm -hmm. with this. Now everybody, I have read virtually everything that Martin Luther King's written. Mm -hmm. Great admirer. But you know what made Martin Luther King such a threat? Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Now you may mm -hmm. not believe that, mm -hmm. but the choice was: Do we want to go with this man who right. sounds like Gandhi, mm -hmm. or do we want to go with this man who mm -hmm. says? Let me just tell you something. The We're tired of it. <laughs> it's that balance. Yeah. And we as progressives have to be, you know, we have to, it, it's like you, you have to get those threats. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have yeah. to get those threats. We, right. we have to, because if we're not, we're not saying what we need to say. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody, you know what? Yeah. And I've We're had out of my time. Share, just like you've had your We're out of time. Uh, go for another hour. <laughs> we can go for another hour. <laughs> Let's do this again. This is fun. Yeah, we so, will. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. The Trayvon Martin case is a tragedy at its highest level, and his death has become a rallying cry for all the wrong that still exists in America regarding race and unequal treatment in the criminal justice system. It's rare that a person of color in America hasn't experienced some sort of bigotry or profiling. Many African-American men have been killed since Trayvon's death, and unfortunately, more will follow. As Joy Ann Reed, managing editor of The Grio, states, quote, the Trayvon Martin case is every mother's nightmare, end of quote. Regardless of how the case is decided, what is important is the honest dialogue and debate that this nation must have regarding access to guns and laws such as stand your ground, at a minimum. This case represents the starkest example of the danger of giving people a license to respond to perceived threats with deadly force especially in a state with loose and even weaker gun laws. Until next time, stay informed and stay aware.